things with a delay, so uh, I have to check uh, the Dropbox folder when I get the recordings and uh, upload it to YouTube after this class, hopefully. Um, <clears throat> so let's now move to first serious, well, uh, a randomized algorithm, namely randomized uh, hashing. And remember, the idea was that you are given an assignment to implement hashing, but, uh, uh, and you self-grade it in pairs. You test and grade your partner's implementation, but you suspect that uh, he will uh, decompile your code, look what, you, what function you are using, and then design an input, design inputs uh, for which your hash function has poor performance. Uh, Right, and uh, uh, what do you do in such circumstances? Of course, this is not the real reason why uh, you want to do randomized hashing. It's just that you want to kind of uh, um, to disconnect, uh, to uh, make the statistical features of the keys, uh, which you might not know exactly uh, what it is uh, to make the performance of the hashing independent of the statistical distribution of uh, the keys, uh, the probabilities for individual keys, right? And that's precisely where randomization uh, helps. You know, for example, when you do sorting algorithms, you might want to do two things, right? You can try to find some statistical model of the sets that you will need to sort, right? So, for example, if you are working, you know, in good old times, I guess this doesn't exist anymore, but people use personal checks, right? So you write a check and give it to the uh, cashier, and after a while, they deposit the check in the bank, right? So the bank can get your checks out of order, right? Because some businesses are more efficient, some are less efficient, and they need to sort the checks in order. Which sorting algorithm would you use quick sort uh, in such a case? Uh, hmm? And exactly. You see there, the checks are almost in order, so the quick, so quick sort will have quadratic performance. So you definitely don't want to sort uh, uh, if the sequence is likely to be almost in order. So to decide which sorting algorithms you are going to use depends very much on the statistical distribution of, the, of different orders that the numbers can be in. But that's a very dangerous proposition, right? Because you might simply make a poor estimate and you, or you, didn't, you haven't seen a, a large enough sample, right? So then the best approach usually is uh, rather than trying to utilize uh, particular features of the distribution of the inputs, uh, you only make sure you apply an algorithm that on average performs well and you randomize your inputs, uh, right? So essentially, instead of using the features of the statistic of, of the features of the inputs, uh, you destroy any regularities that might be there by randomizing them because on it, you can then use an algorithm that is fast on average case, right? So um, rather than being clever and trying to use the features of the inputs, usually it's much safer to destroy any features that the inputs might have that can affect the performance and the best way to do that is by randomization, okay? So what you are going to do is you will pick a hash function randomly in a way that is independent on the keys that are actually going to be stored. And this is what will obliterate, that what will remove any correlation on performance from the statistical features of the 
of the keys, right? And then what you do for the life of the, uh, of the hash function, of course, you freeze this randomly chosen function. But uh, on average then, after multiple runs of your program, on average, uh, you are guaranteed that no single input will always evoke the worst case performance. So uh, this is the best kind of design approach. Use an algorithm that on average works well and make sure to kill all the uh, correlations between the in, by randomization of the uh, that input sequences may have. Okay, so how do we do that? Um, so there is a uh, kind of generic way uh, to, you kind of universal way to achieve uh, a good, uh, to generate a good collection of hash functions, yes. <laughs> it's time for retirement. Okay, after this embarrassing incident, uh, uh, let's, uh, uh, let's, uh, my wife tells me I should stop drinking beer. <laughs> I think she might be onto something. Okay, uh, so what we want to do now is how to generate uh, good families uh, of hash functions from which we will pick at random to have a guarantee that on average uh, the hash function will uh, be efficient, right? So there won't be too many collisions, right? So um, the way to do that is uh, uh, to generate something called universal family of hash functions, right? So when do we say that a finite collection H of functions, of hash functions, uh, that map a large universe of keys uh, into a much smaller range from zero to n minus one, so with n many elements that it's uh, uh, universal. We say that uh, a family is universal if for each pair of distinct keys, uh, right, uh, the number of hash functions for which they collide uh, is exactly the total number of uh, hash functions divided by the size uh, of the table, right? So the total size of hash functions divided by the size of the table. What does this guarantee? This guarantees the following, uh, that if you fix any two keys, x and y, and then you randomly pick a hash function. Because the total number of um, hash functions that will cause the collision is h divided by m, the probability of the collision given a randomly picked hash function will be precisely 1 over m, right? Because the whole universe uh, that has uh, cardinality of H, um, ah. so the total universe has cardinality of H many functions and uh, 1 over M, fraction 1 over M, right? So this is of size cardinality of H divided by M, right? Then the probability, if you have any two keys, probability 
to pick a function that will collide will be precisely 1 over m, right? So for any pair of keys, probability that your randomly picked function will collide them is 1 over m. So what are the universal families good for, right? So take any two random, you know, arbitrary keys, say y and z, and you randomly choose a hash uh, function h, and denote by c of y, z, the what's called indicator random variable, namely c of y, z is 1 if the keys y and z will collide under h, right? Otherwise, is equal to 0, right? So c can be only 0, 1, and um, it's 1 in case uh, they collide and 0 otherwise, uh, right? Uh, so what is then the expected value of this random variable, right? Well, the expected value is uh, probability that the two keys will collide times 1, because that's the only case in which uh, c of y x is equal to 1 if they collide plus probability that they don't collide times 0, because c is an indicator random variable. It's either 1 or 0. Well, this will be clearly 0. And here, as we, if the family is universal, probability that your two keys will collide is precisely 1 over m. So the expected value of this indicator random variable is precisely 1 over m. So why do we need that? So assume that, you, uh, that uh, a family H is universal, and assume that you are hashing n keys into a hash table of size m. So let's denote by Cx the total number of collisions that involve the key x. So if key x goes into a particular slot in the table, then the total number of collisions will be number of elements in the slot minus 1, because you took out uh, x, right? Uh, so the total number of collisions will be clearly the sum total of these indicator random uh, variables for all y uh, that are not equal to x. So when y ranges over your uh, uh, universe, right, um, you uh, this will add 1 just in case uh, the y and x uh, collide. So given any key, what is then the expected number of collisions with each element? Well, uh, expectation is a linear operator, so the expected value of this random variable is just sum of these expected values, but we just computed that this is 1 over m, right? And you have n uh, keys to hash, so uh, you took out x, so the total expected value will be the, you will have n minus 1 uh, elements to sum, each of equal value equal 1 over m. So notice if number of elements that you want to uh, hash is smaller or equal than the number of slots, then, of course, the expected number of collisions with each element, right, will be smaller than 1. So this is kind of a guarantee that on average, the slots in the, um, in the there will be no crowded spots in the hash table, simply because the expected number of collisions for each element is small, right? So this is then um, uh, what we do. So if we cho randomly choose a hash function from universal family of functions and hash n keys into a hash table of size m, then the expected number of keys on each slot is uh, equal n over m. So in short, uh, um, probability, uh, so the expected total number of collisions for any particular key is small, it's smaller than 1, 
So on average, your uh, hash function, your hash table will be reasonably, um, reasonably collision free, right? So how do we construct a universal family of hash functions? So this is a very interesting construction for several reasons. Not only that it will produce for us a universal family of hash functions, but it is used in vast number of algorithms, uh, essentially for dimension, uh, re reduction of dimensionality, for example, in databases and uh, um, uh, like, uh, you know, in the, uh, in many other fields. So uh, besides producing a good hash function, this trick, as you will see, is uh, uh, very uh, useful. It's essentially, uh, the trick is that you project uh, a vector onto a randomly chosen vector, right? And uh, so let's see how we do that. So, Let's take R, so your uh, M is the size of hash table, and we choose it to be a prime number. This is not a terribly big restriction because prime numbers are reasonably dense. For any number K, uh, there is always a prime number between K and 2K, right? So, uh, but uh, it, uh, a slight variation of uh, this uh, construction, which you can find in uh, uh, Corman, Laces, and Rivest, and Stein's uh, uh, textbook, uh, uh, does not require primality, but it's just not worth the extra mess to, uh, that is needed to, to reduce, to eliminate this assumption. So you choose R, right? so that the total number of elements in your universe is between m to the r and m to the r plus one. So r will be the floor of log m of u. So m will be pretty large, right? Because uh, you can take a pretty large uh, prime number, one that fits comfortably in the registers, register of your machine, uh, but uh, uh, so a log with a pretty large base will be uh, quite small, right? So R, R will be a reasonably uh, small number compared to uh, the size of the universe, right? So, um, so now the trick is the following. You represent each key in base M. So what would that mean? Uh, this is exactly, so this is kind of a fancy way of, uh, um, you see, uh, you can, so that you can think, so all, if you represent it in base M with digits X0 up to XR, right? Because the total number of keys is between M to the R and R plus, M to the R plus one. So if the base is M, your, uh, um, you will have at less, at most, R, or actually, I guess, uh, strictly, um, it should be, st I guess I could have gone here only up to R minus one, doesn't matter. So say you have at most R digits, uh, uh, no, um, boom, 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 boom. well, okay. So um, you will have at most R plus one many uh, digits in this space. Essentially what we are saying, uh, X is, this exactly means that you represent uh, the number in uh, base uh, M. And the idea is that uh, this potentially large number can be then represented uh, in uh, this way in which each digit is smaller than the size of uh, your table, right? So this is a way to represent a large number as a vector of uh, much smaller uh, numbers, right? So now comes the trick with the projection of a vector to a randomly chosen vector. So you simp your hash function, you will see how it is de the defined, but the key 
trick is uh, when you have a key represented in base m with digits x0 to xr, right? You are, what you are going to do is you are going to project this key to a randomly chosen vector, uh, right? Where you, these guys are all, again, digits, right? So they are between 0 and m minus 1, and there are r plus 1 many of them. And what you do, your hash function will be the following. It will be the scalar product between your key seen as a vector, right? So you have a very large key. You represent it as a vector of its digits in basis m, where m is the size of your uh, hash table. And then uh, just what we did uh, with the uh, discrete Fourier 